Okay, so I have two more sections that I want to cover, and this one is about decomposition methods, which have turned out to be useful in a lot of applications in, um, I'd say, in, in machine learning uh, and SVM and so on. Certainly, they've been used a lot in SVM. So the idea here is very simple. We're going to go back to the canonical unconstrained minimization problem, and instead of trying to take a step in all the components of X at once, uh, at each iteration, I'm just going to pick some subset of the components of X and focus on them, okay, and just take a step in some subset of the components. So um, I'm going to use GK to denote the subset that I'm allowed to change at iteration K. Uh, and I want to just take a step. Again, I, the notations here are a little bit awkward, but this means this is the step at iteration K in component I, okay. So for all the components I that are not in GK, I'm not allowed to move. The step is zero. So you can do various things here. You can, you can do something like just do a, a restricted version of steepest descent on those components in GK. Um, you might want to do more than that. You might actually want to do more than one step in the, in the GK um, uh, partition. You might want to actually try to solve the problem in, in that subset of components or at least take multiple steps or maybe steps from higher order algorithms or something. Um, there's one issue though, when you start having constraints, so in the unconstrained case it's pretty clear uh, what, how this can work, um, but when you, you start imposing the constraints, some constraints on X, it can complicate this strategy. And that's very easy to see if you've just got a, ver a problem in two variables and you've got a constraint that links those two variables, X1 plus X2 equals 1. So suppose I try to do a step by um, only allowing X1 to change, I've got to fix x2, and I want this constraint to continue being satisfied. Well, you can see right away that I can't move, right? So if, I, if I'm satisfying this constraint and I'm fixing x2, um, I really can't change x1 without violating the constraint. So clearly there's something you have to do. Either you have to make sure the sets that you choose are big enough to be consistent with the, to allow you to make a step and yet not violate the constraints, or you have to allow constraint violations or something, okay? There's something you need to do to fix it up. So similar issues arise when you've got, when you're trying to uh, work on or minimizing a, a regularized function, like the ones we've just been talking about, where the regularizer is, say, a group regularizer, where you, you assemble, uh, you can break x into subvectors and you've got a, a regularizer on each subvector of x. You kind of have to choose the uh, the sets GK that you're taking steps in to be unions of these uh, index subsets. All right? You have to somehow choose the GKs to be consistent with this partitioning into regularizers in order for this to work. Otherwise you get the same sort of effect that I illustrate here. Okay? So that's one thing to bear in mind. Now if you're dealing with an L1 regularizer, of course, this is not really an issue because in an L1 regularizer, each component of X appears separately as an absolute value here. So it's not really an issue. But if you're dealing with uh, group regularizers or other kinds of regularizers, it is a bit of an issue. So I said that this kind of approach is, has been used successfully in machine learning, certainly in support vector machines, um, the quadratic programming formulation of the dual uh, kernelized SVM. Um, probably I'd say most of the algorithms that are out there are of this kind. They're, they're decomposition methods of one kind or another. So the famous SMO methods basically, well the thing about SVM, the dual formulation, is that you've typically got bound constraints on the variables and you've got a single linear constraint that links all the variables, right? So the SMO method, the way that it deals with that single linear constraint is that it allows two elements of X to change at each iteration. And the reason it's two instead of one is to overcome exactly this problem that I showed you on the previous slide. If you're allowed to change two components here, then clearly you can change them both while still satisfying this constraint. As long as the change in X1 is the negative of the change in X2, then you can maintain consistency. So that's why in SMO, he lets two components change and they change in a way that the change in one of them cancels out the change in the other one and you're still able to um, satisfy the constraint. Uh, and there are variants on that approach. There are extensions of that approach where you just explicitly pick some subset of size 10 or size 400 and you work on that subset of the variables at any given time. 
And all of these, if you Google these names, you'll, you'll come up with the appropriate references. And some of them date back to 1998 or so. Some of them are more recent, okay? But they're all methods of this type. So what can you say about these, in general, what can you say about this approach of just working on a subset of the variables at a time? Well, there are a couple of ways to analyze it. One is that um, you assume, uh, uh, well, first of all, you have to make, intuitively, you have to make an assumption that you can't ignore any component of x indefinitely, all right, obviously. If you never look at the first component of x, if you never include it in the set gk, then you can't expect to get any kind of convergence because you're just locking in x1 at its current value and never moving. So one way to analyze these methods is to make an assumption that at least every, once every t iterations, every component of x is included in the set gk, all right? So you at least look at it occasionally. And so there's some uh, convergence analysis that just makes that assumption. I call it a generalized Gauss-Seidel. Gauss-Seidel is the sort of approach where you cycle around the components of x and, and they take turns at being updated. So this is sort of a generalization of that idea. So there are convergence analyses uh, due to these authors and a recent paper of mine where we just essentially make this assumption. Um, you can say more about these methods. You can add on regularization terms. You can prove, uh, in some cases, you can prove some sort of global linear convergence rate. We've talked about, yesterday we talked about linear convergence for gradient descent methods as well as sublinear convergence. Um, you can talk about this idea of homing in on the interesting part of the space. Uh, in the L1 case, homing in on the non-zero components of X, and you can prove that these sorts of methods can have those properties. And you can also prove that if you enhance these methods by doing, by switching to a higher order method on the reduced space, you can potentially get fast local convergence as well. But the point I want to make about this is that all these, this flavor, or the, this flavor of algorithm, the analysis is deterministic in nature. You're not assuming randomness in choosing the GKs. All you're assuming is that uh, just every now and then you look at every component, okay, at least once. So let's now th think about more about randomized strategies where there's some randomness in the way that you compose GK. So again, returning to the unconstrained case, let's suppose you have a strategy where you just select GK completely randomly and completely independently at every iteration, okay? So you might have... Um, well, you can do that any way you like. You can just toss a coin for each element and decide whether or not you're going to put it into GK. And now you can define the, the, the step to be just the, the gradient or the negative gradient in each component. So you can imagine that you could use the tools of stochastic gradient to analyze this sort of approach because if it's truly random, the way that you're selecting GK, then the, the overall vector that you get, which is partly made up of gradient elements, partly zeros, is in some sense an unbiased estimate of the full gradient, right? And that's the essential ingredient that we need to analyze stochastic gradient methods, all right? So you could come up with a naive analysis of, um, of a coordinate descent method that just leverages those tools from stochastic gradient, and you could get some sort of... Um, uh, you can get some sort of an uh, convergence theory from that. I want to talk a little bit more about a more specialized theory, um, and I'm going to refer in particular to recent work of Peter Richterich and Martin Takash, uh, and also a recent paper of Yuri Nesterov where they, uh, they analyze this kind of method. And I'll, again, I'll, I'll do what I was doing yesterday. I'll try and give you an almost complete convergence theory on a couple of slides. In this case, I We'll have to skip some details, and the equations get a little bit complicated, so I'll, have, I'll, I'll leave you to dig into the details also yourself to some extent, but most of it will be on the slides here. So here's the setting. I'm going to consider a regularized case. I'm just setting tau equals 1 in the regularization here for simplicity, get rid of at least one of the constants that are floating around. Um, I'm going to assume that you can partition x into subvectors in a way that's somehow consistent with the regularizer. So that again refers to what I had a few slides ago where I had the group sparse regularizer set up. Uh, I'm going to assume that this psi can be partitioned into the sum of 
uh, piecewise uh, psi i's, where each psi i depends on a uh, on just a subvector of x, and all the subvectors are disjoint. And so the way that the way that these algorithms are going to work is, for simplicity, I'm going to assume that you just pick one of these partitions at every iteration and put that in the GK. Okay, so GK consists of one subvector that consists of um, you know one set of related indices, perhaps. So, and the approach is that you make some sort of gradient step on that subvector. Some other features of this approach are that I'm going to assume, as I did yesterday when I was talking about short step steepest descent, that you have some knowledge of the partial Lipschitz constant, and I'll define that on, on the next slide. Okay, so we're interested in the Lipschitz constant, which tells you how fast are the gradients of f changing as you go from x to a nearby point. A partial Lipschitz constant means I'm only allowed to change some of the elements of x, namely the ones in each partition, in a single partition. So given that the changes in x are restricted to a single partition, how fast does the gradient change when I change those elements of x? And I'm going to assume that you have some estimates of those quantities. And lastly, the sort of method I present will allow, does allow parallel implementation. So you can, you can implement this in parallel where you've got different processes implementing different pieces of the vector x. Okay? Although I won't say too much about the details of that. So the basic approach is that you pick one partition, you do a basic short step gradient method, you do the prox linear thing, in other words you take account of this term explicitly by using that shrink operator, and that's pretty much it. Very, very simple. Uh, Richterich and Takash call this uh, randomized coordinate descent for composite functions, RCDC. All right? And it's just one of a, a number of methods that they analyze. Again, I'm going to show you, in a sense, the simplest um, variant. Okay, so, uh, okay, here's what I mean by partial Lipschitz constant. This is what I, this is what I was trying to say in words a moment ago. Um, and L here has the sort of the same meaning as, um, uh, as, I was as I was giving it yesterday, namely it's sort of an upper bound on the eigenvalues of the Hessian but it's actually the partial Hessian restricted to just the variables in component i, okay? So let me back up a little bit. All the components of x are, in, uh, are uh, the components of x are indexed by 1 through n. x is a vector of length n. I'm going to assume that you can break these components into m blocks, and I'm going to denote each block by this i with the, the square brackets around it, okay? And then I'm going to, I'm going to take the n by n identity matrix, and I'm going to carve out the columns that correspond to the indices in block i. It's going to have a subset of these indices in it. And so this matrix ui is a column matrix where each column is an, uh, is an identity vector. It's a vector with all zeros with a single one, okay, corresponding to the, in a location that corresponds to the, uh, to the indices in i. And so the Lipschitz constant L here is basically an upper bound on the eigenvalues of the Hessian or the partial Hessian that corresponds to block I. In other words, if I take the full n by n Hessian and pull out just the submatrix of that Hessian where the rows and columns uh, are just the elements in the set I um, and take the uh, upper bound in the eigenvalue of that quantity, that gives me Li. And another way to express that is to say uh, Li is the different, is the the, the potential change I can get by making steps along just the components involved in block I. Okay, and I'm going to assume, as I said a moment ago, that these blocks are chosen so that they're somehow consistent with the structure of the regularizer. Okay, a little bit of notation here uh, gets a little bit hairy, but it's not too bad. I'm going to assume you've got a norm on each block and you can combine the norms for, for each individual block of x into an overall norm on x by using some, by applying some weights and summing them up and taking the square root, okay? So of course you can get the overall two norm of, of uh, x by just setting all the w's to one, all right? And then you just get the sum of squares of all the elements in x. But we need a little bit more flexibility to analyze some of these methods uh, in, in terms of how we weight the different components. So I, I'll put a a set of weights in there as well. And I'm going to assume you also have some measure of the size of the level set. Now what this is, I should have drawn a picture of this, x star is the set of solutions of this problem, 
and little x star is an element of the solution set. So I'm saying, given that you've got a value of x, you're interested in considering all the, value, all the uh, vectors y who, has a, who have a function value better than x. So psi here is the combination of f and, uh, sorry, phi here is a combination of f and psi, okay? So you're interested in all the vectors y that have a better function value than x, and you want to see how big is that set. Is it really spread out or is it sort of concentrated around the solution set? So this quantity rw of x tells you how big um, this set of, uh, of vectors y that's better than x is. Okay, some sort of diameter of that set. And that comes into the convergence analysis. So here's the approach. And it looks a lot like what we've been talking about. What we do is pick a single index i, a single partition, and we solve this prox linear type problem. This is exactly the problem that we saw when I was talking about shrink algorithms a moment ago. We set up the problem by taking the partial gradient over just the vectors in partition i. We add on this prox term, where you've got this uh, Lipschitz constant, Li, corresponding to partition i. You have this penalty, which penalizes the, the two norm of the step. And then you add on the, the piece of the, of the regularization function just corresponding to component i. So you don't need to look at all the other um, uh, partitions, uh, j not equal to i, because you're not taking any steps in those components. So the x's corresponding to the blocks j are not changing. You only need to look at what's happening to the, the piece of the regularizer that's affected by component i. Okay? So this is basically a partial version of the prox linear type functions that I, that I was uh, telling you about in the last lecture. Now there's a little bit of a, a twist on this. You, again, you, um, we're allowed to use some flexibility in how likely we are to choose each index. We will spend most of our time talking about the method where you're equally likely to choose each of the m indices. You're equally likely to choose any block to update at any given iteration. And your choice at any iteration is completely independent of the choices you made at earlier iterations. But again, to allow a little bit of general, uh, generality, we're going, to, um, we're going to say that let's suppose we've got a set of probabilities, pi, associated with each index. And let's suppose that pi tells us how likely we are to choose index i at each step. Maybe I'll just mention why we might need that flexibility. We might need that flexibility because if we're dealing with problems where the Li is larger uh, or smaller, we might have to take more or less time. We might have, it might be worth our while concentrating more on, the, on, on those partitions where the problem is, in, in a sense, more ill-conditioned. So it might be worthwhile to sort of uh, be more likely to choose uh, index i for updating in the case where partition i is a, is a slightly harder problem than the other partitions. So that might, that might be why we need that flexibility. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Okay, so the approach is we pick i using whatever probability, probability distribution we've defined. We solve this subproblem, we get a step dki, and we update partition i using this formula. Notice I've had to expand dki to the length of the full vector, and I do that by using this matrix uik, which selects out the uh, columns of, uh, of uh, selects out the elements of x that are uh, present in partition i. So, uh, okay, so very much along the lines of this proxilinear type method I was talking about earlier. Okay, so this is where I try to give you a flavor of how this method is analyzed. And it, it's not, again, it's fairly elementary, but it's somewhat technical, so I'm just going to give you, uh, I'm not going to delve into all the details, but there are three basic steps in showing that you get some sort of convergence of this, this approach. The sort of convergence we're aiming for, by the way, is to show that the, uh, the error in in phi, which is now the composite objective consisting of f plus psi, the expected error in phi, the closeness to the optimal value, decreases below a certain threshold epsilon. So again, this is the same sort of analysis as I was using in the uh, constant step SGD. We define a threshold epsilon that we're aiming for. We're trying to iterate long enough to get below that threshold in some expected sense. 
okay? Except that here we don't use an expectation. But what we're aiming for is to get um, the, the is to get the um, error measure below a threshold with some high probability, okay? So I, I, I'm going to define rho to be the, um, the probability of failure, essentially, the probability that I'll fail to get below the threshold. So rho might be something like 0 0.01 or, or 10 to the minus 5 or something like that. So I want to iterate long enough that I get within, I get, I get my accuracy measure below epsilon with probability at least one minus rho, okay? Different from expectation. Okay, and this, and ultimately I want, I, I want to ask the question, um, how many steps do I need to take to achieve this? Okay, what value of k do I need to achieve this? So the first part of the analysis is sort of a technical lemma. And it says, let's suppose we just have a sequence of random variables, and suppose that the expected value of uh, of xi k, of xi k, given that you know, sorry, the expected value of xi k plus one conditional on xi k is less than or equal to some constant less than one times xi k. In other words, you're expected to decrease xi from one iteration to the next, provided xi k is above some threshold, okay? Now, when you look at that, you would sort of think that in the long run, xi should be getting smaller, okay? It should be getting smaller because we expect it to decrease at every step. This isn't saying that it's definitely going to decrease, but we expect it to, to do so. So given that the xi k satisfy this property, what we can prove is that provided we iterate for at least this many iterations, we're almost guaranteed to get xi k below the threshold epsilon. So none of this is tied to optimization or anything else. This is purely a technical statement about a sequence of uh, scalar random variables. Okay, the number of iterations, by the way, it obviously depends on rho. Rho is a probability of failure. The smaller you make the probability of failure, the more iterations you're going to need to take. The smaller you make the threshold epsilon, the more iterations you're going to need. Um, but both of those come in in a log term, which is not too bad, okay? The, the, the crucial term is this term that governs how much you're expected to degree psi by at every iteration. And that really does affect the convergence. So, if C2 is, is very large, that means that you're only making a marginal expected decrease in psi at each step, then the number of iterations k is going to go up proportionately. Okay? So a purely technical limit to start off with. Okay. The second part of the analysis is showing that the expected improvement in the objective function, you make the observation that the expected improvement in the objective function is the average of the n, the m possible improvements that you could have made for each partition. Now let me explain what I mean by that because the formula is looking pretty hairy. Okay, so what I mean by that is that let's suppose, well we are analyzing the case where we're equally likely to choose each partition. All right, so the expected improvement in F is going to sort of be the average that you would get from choosing each partition, right? That makes perfect sense. Okay, so if you choose partition one, you, you're sort of predicting that you'll get a certain decrease. If you choose partition two, you're predicting that you get a certain decrease. The expected decrease is just going to be average of all those predictions. And that's the, um, that's the statement in the second part of the analysis. Okay, and so the, the formula here is just sort of codifying that. That the expected value of psi, the function, at xk plus one, given that you're starting at xk, given that you're just taking a single step, is equal to the current value of psi plus this expression which just captures the average over all the possible choices of i. That's all this is. This is just the, these three terms here are just the, um, the value of the uh, subproblem that you need to solve at, at, uh, at step k for partition i. Okay, so that's just going back two slides to what we had here. I've just plugged that in. And I've had to correct by the current value of the regularized partition I. I've had to uh, subtract that out. So this basically is the expected change that you're going to get from partition I. And then this thing is the average of the whole thing. So that's all it is. And I've codified JK here is just, just captures this average. I'm just trying to clean up that notation a little bit. Okay, and the third, so that's the second part of the analysis. Very straightforward, very believable really. And the third part of the analysis is saying that um, uh, 
the predicted di uh, distance to the solution, the predicted distance to the solution, after you've taken a step at iteration k, is at least a multiple less than one of the current distance to the solution. Okay, so we're talking about, about the prediction here. We're saying that um, uh, after you've taken the step, the subproblem is making a sort of a forecast of how much improvement you're going to get in the problem. We're saying that that forecast is telling you that you, you're going to get a significant improvement, some multiple less than one times the current gap. Okay, and what does that multiple depend on? It depends on the current gap, it depends on the distance to the solution using this norm that's sort of weighted by the current set of Lipschitz constants. That's why I had to define this norm in general terms because this denominator here needs a weighted norm rather than a two norm. Okay, so it's pretty easy to see how all this is going to come together because this step is telling you how much improvement you're predicting to make. This step is telling you that the expected improvement in the actual function is at least equal to the predicted improvement, okay? So it's easy to see how you can glue these two pieces together. And then this piece is, is it looks an awful lot like this. This piece is telling you that the, um, oh, at least when you glue them together, it's gonna look an awful lot like this. It's gonna tell you that you expect to make, uh, you expect to decrease so, uh, phi by at least a multiple, uh, at a certain multiple at every step. Now you can see that that multiple is bounded away from uh, away from zero because I'm assuming that all of this analysis takes place when the optimality gap is greater than epsilon, okay? When, the op when, when you're further away from the solution than epsilon. So that means that we can bound this quantity here away from zero, which sort of guarantees that the amount by which I'm reducing the optimality at each iteration is bounded away from one. It's some quantity that's strictly less than one, okay? So that's how I can, um, that's why I can apply that, that uh, first lemma. So putting all these pieces together, we end up with this result, that this is how many iterations you need to take in order to get reduction of the optimality gap below this threshold epsilon. Okay, so let's look at what it's related to. It's related to the initial optimality gap. It's related to obviously to epsilon, the precision you're trying to achieve. It's related to the uh, probability of failure. And it's also related to the initial distance that x naught is from the solution. This is the radius of the level set. Okay, so it's, which is some sort of function of the distance. And altogether that, if you take this many iterations, you're guaranteed to get within epsilon of the solution with this probability. Okay. So I've really got most of the pieces there. I'm not skipping out too much of the analysis. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so all of that is just for the, um, did I need strong convexity here? No, I didn't even need to use strong convexity in this case. If you've got strong convexity of phi, you can say more, okay? If you've got strong convexity of phi with respect to some weighted norm with this convexity modulus mu, we saw this expression yesterday uh, when we were talking about convexity moduli or something like it. In that case, you can, you can say even more. You've, got an actually, you've actually got an expected linear rate of convergence in the, uh, in the optimality gap, in the, in the error of f. That goes down, in expectation, it goes down linearly with the number of iterations k. Okay, so again, a result of quite a different flavor from what we had on the previous slide. The previous slide was telling us if you take this many iterations, you're guaranteed, you're almost guaranteed to get below epsilon. This is actually telling you how fast you're, you're, you're going to, uh, it, it's actually telling you that you'll converge at a linear rate, okay, which is a stronger statement. We often see linear rates in conjunction with strong convexity, and this is no, um, this is no exception. So, I mean, when you look at this, it's a little bit surprising because in the case where we were taking exact gradient steps, we were able to get a linear convergence rate. Here we're taking a step just on a piece of the gradient and we're still able to get a linear rate. Now of course you pay a price because the constant in the linear expression is still less than one, but it's closer to one than it would be in a, if you had the full gradient naturally. So there is a price, but formally the rate is, is more or less the same. And here are some um, 
Uh, here are some references. Actually, this paper of Richterich and Takash was, was only revised uh, on Sunday. So if you go to Richterich's website, you'll get one that's two days old that has that analysis that I showed you along with a lot of generalizations. Okay, are there any questions about, about this part? Before I dive into the final part? Okay. So, <clears throat> let me finally talk about, uh, say a little bit about augmented Lagrangian methods, alternating direction methods, and illustrate them with a few examples. Okay, so the canonical problem here that I'm going to address is a linearly constrained minimization problem. Okay, minimize f of x subject to some linear constraints ax equals b, where a typically has more columns than rows, so x is not completely determined by these constraints. So there's, you can define this quantity called the augmented Lagrangian, which sort of combines the objective with a linear combination of the constraints, and then adds on a weighted sum of squares of the constraint violations. All right. Now the, the straight Lagrangian is just the first two terms in this expression. And the Lagrangian, if some of you might know some constraint optimization theory, Lagrangian is a very important quantity in telling you whether or not a point x star is actually a solution of this problem. By looking at the Lagrangian, and particularly its derivative with respect to x, by choosing this, this uh, quantity lambda, which is called the vector of Lagrange multiplies, by choosing it appropriately, you can figure out whether or not a given point x is stationary or not. You sort of have a testable um, uh, criterion for figuring out whether it's stationary, whether x is stationary. And it sort of follows that the Lagrangian is very important in designing algorithms for actually solving this problem. And not only does it tell you whether a point is, is optimal, but it, 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 it sort of forms the basis of algorithms. And one of these algorithms is the so-called augmented Lagrangian approach. I'm not going to go into this approach in full detail. It's a classical approach in optimization. dates back to the early 70s, uh, where it was proposed by uh, uh, some of the uh, fathers of the field, uh, Rockefeller and uh, Hestonese and some others. It was explicated a lot during the 70s. There was a lot more work on it. Uh, and then in the late 80s, a code appeared that implemented this. It was a very successful code. Um, the basic approach is that you, you treat this as a penalty term, so you pick some value of the penalty constant, you fix the value of lambda at some current estimate, and you minimize this function with respect to x. Okay? You then update lambda. You update your latest guess of the organic multiplies using this formula. There are actually other sort of enhanced formulas you can use as well, but this is the basic one. And then you sometimes possibly change the value of rho. You may increase the penalty a little bit. You may decide to leave it the same thing. So what tends to happen, if everything's OK, uh, is that as the iterations proceed, the lambdas converge to the optimal values of the Lagrange multipliers for this problem, and the x converges to the solution of the problem. OK? If everything goes uh, right, that's, that, that's what happens for this basic method. So what's the hard part in implementing this method? Well, this step is not very hard. Okay, this is just a matrix vector multiply and a, uh, a, a vector addition. The tricky part is typically this part, where you fix lambda, you fix rho, and you try to minimize this, this function with respect to x. That's, typically, that's a, at least as hard as minimizing, x, as minimizing f by itself. But it, often it's not that much harder, because we're adding on a linear term involving x, we're adding on a quadratic term, um, so uh, you know, often these terms are not as hard to deal with as this. Sometimes they're significant though. I mean, if f is originally a linear function, then this is going to be harder to minimize than just f by itself. But often it's not that much harder. So this is the basic approach. Oh, here is some history that I started to tell you about. Um, I think it's fair to say that after this code came out, it was a very successful code for general nonlinear programming. It sort of lost favor because it was superseded to some extent by sequential quadratic programming methods and by interior point methods for nonlinear programming. So it, it often wasn't as effective on sort of general nonlinear programs as those alternative approaches. 
But I, I think it's fair to say that it's been revived in the last few years in the context of sparse and regularized optimization because it's turned out to be a very uh, uh, powerful method uh, in, in dealing with different kinds of sparsity and, and, and dealing with partition sort of, of functions for the reasons that I'll, uh, I'll discuss when I show you some examples in the next few slides. Okay, so what if we take that basic approach and apply it to this problem where there's a little bit more structure than what I showed you before? So instead of a single uh, variable vector x, I'm going to consider that you actually want to minimize over two vectors, x and z, and your objective consists of some function of x and some function of z. So it's separable according to x and z. But I'm going to assume that x and z are linked in the sense that they both appear in the linear constraint together. Okay? So if, if they appeared in two separate linear constraints, then I could just break this problem into two separate problems, one in x and one in z, and solve them separately, and that would be easy. But I'm, I'm going to assume you can't do that, that they both appear mixed up in, in, this, uh, uh, in this linear constraint. Now I'm going to apply that approach of augmented Lagrangian that I showed you two slides ago to exactly this problem. And you can see that all I've done here is just you know, written down the definition of L. I put the objective here, it's got both F and H in it. I put lambda transpose the constraint here. And I've got this penalty term involving, again, the constraint violations. Okay? So the basic augmented Lagrangian would be that, first of all, I fix lambda, I fix rho, and I minimize this whole thing with respect to x and z together. Okay? Then I update lambda using that formula here. In fact, I maybe update rho. The problem with doing that is that in this, in this uh, problem of minimizing this, this quantity with respect to x and z jointly, x and z appear coupled in this problem here. They're coupled in this term here. Okay? If I multiply out this term, I'll get a quadratic term that involves x transpose some matrix times z. Okay? And so it won't be necessarily so easy to minimize with respect to x and z jointly. They are separated in this, this term here and they're separated in this term, but they're coupled through this term. So one way to sort of generalize that approach, the basic augmented Lagrangian approach, is in a sense kind of the obvious way. You try minimizing with respect to x and z separately. So, so here what I do is uh, fix z at its current value. I fix not only lambda and rho, but I also fix z and just minimize this quantity just with respect to x. Okay? Then I'm going to fix x and minimize this quantity just with respect to z. So I force it to be a partition problem. In effect, by, um, I decouple by fixing each of these two variables in turn. Then after I've done that, I update lambda and proceed. So this is an approximation to the basic augmented Lagrangian idea that alternates between updating x and updating z. That's why it's called alternating direction method of multiplies. Okay. Now there are many wrinkles on this. I, I may not want to update, I may not want to do this minimization exactly, I may not want to do this one exactly. I might just want to take a few gradient steps here, do some sort of crude uh, minimization. Um, so there are many ways that you can uh, generalize this basic idea, but this is, you know, this is essentially what's going on. So here are a few observations about this. Uh, I've got a few typos here I should fix. Um, you, know, you can think of it as block coordinate descent. So it's related to what I just told you about in the last section. Because here what I'm doing is breaking the unknown vector into these two blocks, the x block and the z block, and I'm alternating between taking, uh, a, you know, by, by working on the x block and working on the z block. So it's a lot like this coordinate descent that I showed you on the last few slides. I, I can also observe that again, just as in the basic um, augmented Lagrangian, usually the minimizations over x, and, over x and z are not much more complicated than minimizing over f and minimizing over h, okay? Because you're just adding a quadratic term. And sometimes that doesn't make the problem all that much harder. I already said this, that you might just want to minimize the problems in exactly. Um, it can be slow, okay? Because like any alternating direction method, um, you know, they can be slow and this can be slow. 
But I also want to make the point that there are many successful applications of this idea recently in areas like compressed sensing, image processing, matrix completion, uh, sparse principal components analysis, and so on. And there's a nice recent uh, long uh, paper by Boyd et al., Eckstein and Parikh and uh, I think some other people, that's a hundred odd pages long, it's, you can get it easily from Boyd's website, um, that sort of summarizes this ADMM idea and gives a bunch of applications and a little bit of, uh, a little bit of theory. Okay, so let me describe some applications where this idea, this basic idea is, uh, is very useful. And at first they may not look to have that kind of a structure that I showed you, where you've got a block of x variables and a block of z variables. But we can always reformulate them so they have that structure. So let's look once again at this problem of minimizing f of x, where f of x is a sum of, of individual functions fi. So we've talked about this problem at length when we talked about SGD, we talked mostly about this problem. Okay? Well it turns out you can use ADMM to tackle this problem as well. And here's one way you can do it. You can actually give each fi its own copy of the variable vector x. So I'm going to create all these new variables xi, which are just copies of x. So I'm greatly expanding the number of variables in the problem. I'm replicating it m times. And I can restate this problem as a constrained optimization problem. I can say that um, I'm going to have each fi just minimize its version of x, but ultimately I want all of these versions, xi, to be equal to this master copy x. Okay? So it's very easy to see that this problem here is exactly this problem here. Okay? Just restated in a, you know, as a constrained optimization problem. So now I can apply ADMM to this, because this has the form that I showed you a few slides ago. I can set x to be x, and I can set z to be all of these replicates. Okay? And now I can just apply that ADMM approach. So let's look at the steps of ADMM. ADMM says, first of all, I have to fix x and fix lambda and fix rho and minimize with respect to z. That's what I'm doing here. I'm minimizing with respect to all of the xi's for a fixed value of xk plus 1, fixed value of rho k, fixed value of lambda k. Okay? Now, I can do all these in parallel because all of these xi's now appear completely separately in this problem, right? So there's no need to have a sum of the sum of fi's here. I can, they're, they're completely separable. That was the point of replicating the variable. I was setting up a situation where because each fi had its own variable, I could minimize each of them independently and in parallel, okay? So I can do all of these in parallel and that constitutes minimization with respect to z. Now the second, second step in ADMM is I have to minimize with respect to x. So let's go and look at this augmented Lagrangian and figure out what happens when I fix all the xi's, I fix the rho and I fix the lambda and just minimize with respect to x. Well the interesting thing about that is that x itself doesn't appear anywhere in this objective, right? I've replicated it out. x only appears in the constraint. So when I minimize this object with respect to the xk, I can actually write down a closed form solution. I can write down the minimum in closed form. Because this function here is just a quadratic function of xk. It doesn't appear in this potentially nonlinear term here. So the minimization with respect, I can, with respect to x I can do explicitly. And here is a solution of that problem. Okay? And then finally I have to update the lambdas. And that follows the usual form. Okay, so what have I gained by replicating x m times. What I've gained is that I can potentially do all these things in parallel. I've, get, I've potentially gained massive parallelism here. But then in between those parallelization steps I have to do this some sort of, I have to do this sort of consensus thing where I replace x with basically the average of all the x's, all the xi's that I've got out of this step. So you can think of this, in fact it's been called this, a, a consensus kind of algorithm where you let each fi run away and minimize its own x, but in between minimizations with respect to xi, I sort of come up with a consensus value of x by averaging all the individual values. Okay? So this is just one application of ADMM, 
You can also do ADMM when you've got, a, in a sense, sort of awkward intersections where you're trying to impose different constraints on X, which individually are easy to deal with, but collectively are difficult to deal with. And a classic example of that is where you've got a matrix variable X, and you'd like that matrix variable, and, and suppose it's symmetric, you'd like that matrix variable both to have all non-negative entries, which is what I mean by this constraint here, and you also want that matrix to be positive semi-definite, which is what I mean by that constraint there. Now, you can project easily onto each of those two sets individually. If I give you a matrix X that's symmetric and square and so on, by doing an SVD, you can project onto the set of non-negative matrices by just zeroing out the negative singular values and negative eigenvalues. You can easily project onto the set of uh, element-wise non-negative matrices by simply replacing all the negative elements of X by zero. Okay? So individually, it's easy to project onto each of these two sets. But projecting onto the intersection of these two sets is hard. Okay? So this is another place where you can use ADMM to sort of partition out um, these two constraints. So how do we do that? Well, let me pose this in a little bit more general setting. What I'm going to do is to say, let's suppose I'm trying to minimize some objective subject to X being in a bunch of closed convex sets, omega i. And maybe I have up to M of these. Okay, so what I do is write out that problem in exactly the form I had on the previous slide. I've sort of omitted the details here, okay? But what I'm going to do is I'm going to write it as a problem in this form where each of these fi's is going to be an indicator function for the set omega i. In other words, I'm going to define fi to be zero when x belongs to omega i and infinity when x is not in omega i, okay? I'm going to do that and then I'm going to apply exactly this procedure here, okay? Replicating the variables, um, you'll see I've got xi's here, just like I had on the previous slide, rotating a master copy, xk, and so on. So this is just a special case of what I had on the last slide, and this is how, this is how things specialize. Uh, instead of having uh, the function fi in here, I'm just minimizing explicitly restricting xi to the set omega i. Okay? So this step here corresponds exactly to this step on the previous slide. Okay? Um, the averaging step, actually it's not exactly the same because in the averaging step I'm including the function f explicitly, the original objective. So this part of it is exactly the averaging step from the previous slide, but I'm also slotting in the value of f that we're trying to minimize. I'm using the master copy of x explicitly in the, uh, in the averaging step. And then the update for, for lambdas is exactly the same. So again, you notice that you can do these steps in parallel and independently. So in other words, if I'm applying this approach to this problem, this subproblem here, m is equal to 2, I've got actually two subproblems here, they're completely independent. One of them is trying to project something under the set x uh, um, positive semi-definite, which we know how to do. The other one's trying to project under the set x non-negative, which we know how to do. So we're able to sort of pull apart um, this intersection into two, it, it's two constituent constraints and deal with each of them separately. The price we pay, of course, is that we have to have probably many iterations of this method before we get reasonable convergence. We can do similar things uh, to the regularized or sparse optimization formulation that I talked about in the last session. So given that we've got um, an objective function of this form, f of x plus tau times some regularizer, we can replicate the variable x into two copies. And we can give f one of the copies and we can give psi the other copy. And we can impose the constraint that x is equal to z. The two copies are equal to each other. Okay? So you can see pretty obviously that this is exactly the same problem as this. Now I can do ADMM, going back five slides, to exactly this problem. Okay? So I can break the minimization, the joint minimization of f and psi into two separate minimizations. The x step fixes z, in other words it eliminates psi from the problem, it's not going to change, and just minimizes it with respect to x. Okay? The z problem fixes x, so it eliminates f from the problem, 
and just minimize it with respect to psi plus this leftover term. Okay? Now, these two steps separately, by pulling apart the two parts of the objective, maybe these two steps are much easier individually to do than the joint minimization. Okay? Maybe we can do one of them exactly by, for example, doing a shrink operation. If this is the L1 norm, you can solve, we can solve this guy in closed form using that shrink operation I told you earlier. Maybe it's hard to solve, in which case we have to do, um, we may only be able to solve it inexactly. Okay? But still, it's probably going to, it's often going to be easier to pull these two parts of the objective apart and deal with them separately than to deal with them jointly. Okay, that's all I really wanted to say about um, uh, augmented Lagrangian and ADMM. Uh, if you want a little more information, there's, um, there's this uh, tech report that I mentioned, or this 100-page paper, which talks mostly about ADMM. There's an old paper on um, uh, 20 years old now by Eckstein and Bertsakis, where they laid the foundation for, the, for this method. And this paper was, you know, people didn't pay much attention to it until quite recently. But it's turned out to have some, um, you know, a lot of the foundational theory is in that paper. And then Steve Boyd gave a presentation based on this report at the last NIPS uh, workshop. And there's actually a video of him giving this, um, presenting uh, more or less the stuff in this report uh, that's easy to find on the web. And I've got the location there. So that's it. I made it to the end. I've got five minutes to spare. So we have time for some questions. <laughs>